Now more than ever, people need to go within and plug into that cellular memory, plug into the divine source, detach as much as possible from the matrix. Hello again, everybody. This is James Bartley, and you're listening to the Cosmic Switchboard Show. Today, my very special guest is Lon Strickler. Lon is a radio talk show host at Arcane Radio, longtime cryptid investigator from Pennsylvania, and he's just come out with a new book, uh, Alien Disclosure. Lon has been a guest on our show in the past, and he's got a lot of information to share. So without any further ado, Lon Strickler, welcome back to the Cosmic Switchboard Show. Thanks for having me, James. Yeah, Lon, so much is going on. We talked briefly before we started uh, this interview. Uh, where would you like to start? I mean, there's just so much, it seems to me, a lot of cryptid activity going on. Last time you were here, I don't think we really got into the, the Gargoyle Batman uh, saga. That, uh, Correct me if I'm wrong, it's still ongoing in Chicago and then there, thereabouts. Yeah, this, um, well, actually, the first, the first sightings that were reported uh, this winged humanoid were in uh, the late summer of 2011. There were only three sightings at that point. But uh, towards the spring of 2017, this thing really blew open. For some reason, uh, people were having these encounters and sightings. Uh, it wasn't always in the air. Sometimes people saw it standing and walked upon it at night for the most part. Um, I mean, the, the, the early sightings were very similar to that of a Mothman, uh, you know, with that type of wing structure, insectoid-type wing structure. The red eyes, uh, the small head, and the humanoid body, about five to six foot in height, and 10 to 12 foot wingspan. But as we gradually went along, I guess into the fourth and fifth sighting, these wings were all described as being gargoyle-like, bat-like. Same size overall, but, um, you know, some did have the red eyes, some didn't. So, you know, because of this, and most of these sightings at that time were in the Chicago uh, land area. Uh, we were getting sightings in northern Indiana, some of the outlining um, uh, suburbs. But eventually, after the after 2017, most of the sightings we were getting were further north of Chicago and northern Illinois and up into Wisconsin. Uh, we had some sightings as well into central Indiana. So, uh, you know, we occasionally get one or two here and there. This winter, we got a, a few sightings in southern Wisconsin. Uh, many were in the same town. So that was interesting because we hadn't had any sightings, uh, during the cold weather months. But, uh, of course, now this, these sightings in the area of Woodstock, Wisconsin were, uh, I guess it was Wood, uh, Woodstock, Illinois. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, they were described as actually looking like a Bigfoot and with huge wings. So that kind of was different than what we were getting. So overall, I'd say with all the sighting reports that we had gotten, the ones that we considered to be, uh, you know, very credible, we're up to over 80 sightings now. And the creature you just described likened to a Bigfoot, does that yeah. mean that perhaps it was a big, hairy, kind of robust creature with wings? That's what it was described as, you yeah. know. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> just, just what we need. Uh, and, and actually, we, we did get a set, set of footprints or a, a, a foot track in the snow that was kind of odd. Uh, it was kind of a narrow foot. Uh, it was long. I'd say it was anywhere from 15 to 17 foot in length, maybe six foot, uh, six inch, um, excuse me, uh, 15 to 17 inches in length and uh, maybe six inches in width. Uh, so this was, uh, the, and actually the, 
the witness is very credible. He he had been driving back from the drugstore at night, and uh, you know he contacted me and let me know about it. I got to talk directly to him. His wife is very prominent in the the town. Uh, we had to be careful about that, but then we started getting other sighting reports. We had two extra ones beyond that. Uh, it somehow got into the press. The press started reporting it. So, uh, you know, I, we were careful about what we were getting, but I, I'm quite sure those three sightings were very, very credible and uh, had nothing to do with the re the um, report coming, you know, out of the out of the media. Do you get the feeling that uh, there may be windows or uh, windows of time, if you will, when these types of gargoyle or Batman or Mothman appearances make themselves manifest? Because there's some talk amongst some researchers over the years that uh, certain times of the year, whether it's got anything to do with the cycles of the moon or whatever, these things seem to pop up uh, and – and also, do you notice any commonality with the witnesses? Is there anything peculiar or distinct about them that makes it more likely for these types of people, a particular demographic, to see these creatures? Not necessarily. I, uh, if you look at the sightings overall, uh, this came, they came from all s sorts of people. I mean, ways of life, social, economic levels everywhere. I mean, we did have some sightings in... Uh, an area called uh, Little Village, which is a, a highly Hispanic area. Uh, overall, we had seven sightings there. But we've had sightings in other neighborhoods as well. So, you know, a lot of professionals had, had contacted us, lawyers, uh, people who had professional jobs. We had police officers contact us. So, yeah, it, it kind of ran the gamut as far as uh, people that reported it. As far as why these things showed up or what spurred these things to come out, I, I, know I we haven't really figured that out. That's something we've been looking into. Um, you know, the team I had included uh, s several researchers in the area, plus I had Rosemary Ellen Guiley helping me as well. And I, I'd be honest with you, when we all looked at it and all – Put it, put it all together, we almost all had different versions of what we think happened. But for the most part, I, I believe it was some type of interdimensional type being. Uh, we had two reports uh, somewhat later that these th this thing was seen by credible witnesses where it actually had just disappeared, just like it went through a, a veil or through a unseen door so uh, yeah, that yeah was I, I think there's a, I think there's interdimensional aspect to it, yes. aspect to it. and, and I, actually I believe that for a lot of cryptids as well uh, I, I think uh, a lot of the cryptids that people report may actually be have a supernatural aspect to them <clears throat> I, I would agree with that uh, the like, for example, in the Skinwalker Ranch episode, there was these humongous wolves, these, you know, four-legged ones. They looked yeah. like a wolf in all respects, except they were they were huge. And also, some of these cryptids, we've talked about this before, they manifest metaphysical-type capabilities. They don't leave tracks. They can be seen to levitate. The ones with wings don't need sometimes to even flap their wings to fly and levitate. So that there's something going on that doesn't really jibe with our understanding of physics. Yeah, the uh, these these winged humanoids in the Chicago area, and subsequent reports, uh, there were very few of them where this thing was actually using its wings to propel itself. It was basically like it was gliding with speed, or it was able to accelerate from like from the ground like a rocket without excuse, you know, without flapping the wings. So it's an unexplained propulsion to it you know of course first of all we thought maybe it might have been some type of uh artificial you know device but now nah, these things were flesh and blood and uh you know some of the maneuvers and such that were explained to us 
or just simply impossible for someone to be doing this either in a squirrel suit or you know man, uh, maneuvering some type of uh, mechanical object have there been cases of these gargoyle type beings like roosting on people's rooftops and leaving scratch marks or some other sign that they've been present? Yeah, there have been. I mean, um, I haven't seen any of that evidence. Some of the, you know, some of the witnesses have stated there were scratch marks. Uh, there was uh, a case I received before this all started in Chicago from Chicago where a woman was actually attacked and had a fairly severe laceration on her back. Um, so, you know, there have been, has been some physical evidence, but to date I haven't seen any of it. Um, you know, it, we haven't, you know, honestly, we haven't even gotten any discernible photographs as well. Uh, and that, and there's a lot of reasons for that because of the shock value. Uh, these things were fleeting. They were fast. Hard to get a photograph of something that's moving by so quickly. So, um, you know, I think it has a lot to do with just like with the Bigfoot phenomenon. People, you know, they get these blurry images of the thing, or it's it's just very hard to get a decent photograph of it. So, um, I think there's a connection there somehow. In some of the other cryptid accounts, Lon, people talk about. Uh a sudden silence in the area, a vacuum stillness. They, they talk about feeling a sense of dread of being watched. Uh, in some of the Sasquatch encounters, they talk about the infrasound being uh, emitted by these uh, Sasquatch-type creatures, and it kind of freezes people in their tracks. Has any of these Batman, Gargoyle-type creatures manifested such capabilities? Yeah, they have. Um, a lot of the witnesses stated that they had this foreboding feeling. Um, some had became physically weak, uh, especially the ones where they had close contact with it. Uh, you know, where their knees or their legs would become so weak that they had to sit down somewhere. they become somewhat nauseous or, you know, feeling dizzy. It would take them several minutes to gather themselves and uh yeah i mean there, there does seem to be some kind of physical manifestation uh or reaction to the sight of this thing i wonder if some of the eyewitnesses especially those in close proximity to these beings if they'd suffered any long-term uh maladies or after effects because as you know lon and this is pointed out in your, your fine book, Alien Disclosure. Some people that have had encounters with ETs have had long-term chronic maladies as a result of their encounters. Uh, has there any been any reports of, of people who've had these Batman gargoyle-type encounters that they likewise uh, have developed chronic illnesses uh, over time? We had one witness by the name of Billy um, uh, you know, his name is Billy, and he had a sighting in uh, the area of uh, uh, western, a western suburb of Chicago. And he reported he had a rare disease of his eyes, both of them, that manifested after he had these sighting. Um, <clears throat> if it was it the result of what he saw, that we can't prove. And I've seen the medical reports, and he definitely became apparent right after he saw this thing. So, um, you know, I, I don't know if that's the truth or not, but I, you know, or if that's the facts or not. You know, a lot of a lot of the witnesses, I'm quite sure, were traumatized by what they saw. But as far as having a physical ailment, I really, I really don't, I really don't have any evidence of that. Has there been any evidence of any kind of deep black unofficial interest in these uh, flying beings? Because in, in our research, we know that there seems to be some deep black interest in the Sasquatch, in the dogmen, so-called uh, canid beings, and other cryptids, as well as with ETs. 
has there ever been any reports, say, of like mysterious helicopters showing up uh, shortly after the appearance of one of these flying beings? Yeah, we had uh, one instance um, in an area south of Chicago where there seemed to be a lot of uh, military activity. And, in fact, the witness stated that the area where she had seen this wing being, there was a, uh, a military incursion in the area the next day. Now, she hadn't reported it to anyone, so I don't know what the situation was. There had been some instances with black helicopters being seen in and around the areas, but uh, there were just a few of those, but th there were some reports. Now, this is kind of delving into the really scary aspects of this. I've always been a firm believer in remote viewing, clairvoyance, et cetera. And mm -hmm. you've talked about uh, your remote viewing abilities, uh, Lon. And I know I've had some spontaneous kind of remote viewings, which turned out to be quite accurate. It's nothing that I actually planned and, and, and worked on. It's just something that just happened. And, and my, my question is, and this is kind of a scary thought. Has have you ever utilized? And you don't have to answer this, but have you ever utilized your remote viewing skills to kind of tap into these beings? And the reason I say it's scary because some of these beings seem like when people are remotely viewed ETs, for example, suddenly the ETs look at them as if they know they're being remotely viewed. And and I, for one, I, I wouldn't want to remote view a canid or a dog man because I I wouldn't want the thing noticing me. You know what I mean? Has anyone given any thought to remotely viewing not only the gargoyle flying beings, but any of these cryptids. I have made an attempt. I have a friend, uh, and if you read, read my book, Alien Disclosure, I have a friend in Australia who her and her group actually have done some remote view work for me since I'm doing the investigation. It's, it's not prudent for me to be involved with it, but I have allowed her and asked her to look into some of this phenomena that I have been has been reported to me. Uh, these sightings in Chicago, she and I haven't really reported it because I, I I'd like to get some more follow up on it. But I will say that uh, she believes that there is a. Uh, a government connection to it at some degree. Now, that's about all I can say, but I, I she did see a connection with some of the, uh, <clears throat> some of the space exploration activities that have been going on for the past couple of years in relation to what has been going on in Chicago. Now, you know, this was all done, you know, there's no real evidence other than the remote view information. And uh, right now she's been kind of tied up doing doing other things. So we haven't, you know, continued on that. But I do believe that uh, she's quite convinced that there's a, a government connection at some point. Well, for what it's worth, Lana, I intuitively feel that's the case, whether it's simply the government or deep black elements thereof monitoring the situation or perhaps even had a hand in either bringing the beings here or creating circumstances which allowed these beings to enter into our space-time, so to speak. So I, I definitely feel that uh, your colleague is, is on to something in that regard. Yeah, I think she did bring out some aspects and some information that, you know, does seem to tie into what's been going on. Uh, you know, we, we uh, you know, my team and I, we looked in, also looked into the, um, uh, the Collider. Uh, Hadron or CERN. Yeah, because there, there, there is actually a device, an older collider outside of Chicago. 
Now, it is said to not be in use at this time, but I have talked to several people who have looked at the area for me, have been watching the area, and there seems to be a lot of activity around it. So I don't know if this thing has been started back up. Um, that's you know, interesting. That's something we just don't know yet. That's interesting because there may be uh, sensors or equipment that will be able to detect electromagnetic anomalies yeah. over a wide area. So that might be something worth looking into. And then, and then we know that uh, at least in the modern scheme of things, so-called uh, nuclear weapons research, the first nuclear pile was, was – created there in Chicago, Stag Field, et cetera, et cetera. So they've been working on th these kinds of cutting-edge technologies there for some time. Yeah, th there has to be a specific reason why it's showing up in Chicago and in the environs because, um, you know, though we have had sightings in other areas of the country, it hasn't been anywhere near to what's been going on there, and, and let alone in, a, in an urban area. Uh, that that is just something that has never really happened before, been reported. So uh, that you know, that there's definitely a reason. It's just a, a matter of us finding out what it is. It wouldn't surprise me if, at some level, Lon, there seems to be like a socio-engineering or mass psychology aspect to it, to, just to see what happens if let's say for the sake of argument, they allow these beings into our reality to show up here and there and make their presence known just to see the kind of reaction it would garner from certain segments of the society. Because in the overall scheme of things, I, I'm not from Chicago. I don't know if the media there is running with the story, but generally when these things happen, it, it, the research and the investigations is are kind of relegated to an exclusive population of exclusive group of researchers and people interested in that kind of um, uh, research do you feel that there is perhaps some kind of social engineering aspect to this you know it's a possibility you know I, I have been kind of surprised that I have been the person that's that seemed to be getting these reports uh, it didn't seem like anybody else other than me and my group that were getting reports of these these sightings or these encounters, uh, you know, we were we were accused of, of manufacturing a lot of these sightings during the time period, but that that is, couldn't be any further than the truth. I'm from the truth because uh, these were actual sightings, actual reports that people were sending in to us. Uh, it does, it, it, but it is it is intriguing as to why we've been our group in particular was getting these reports. Well, I think at least part of the explanation would be you and your team have developed such a reputation. I mean, your phantoms blog is an absolute classic as far as any kind of 40 in type research and, and phenomena that's going on, be it cryptids, being ETs, being disappearing people, whatever the case may be, your website has it all. So, and for many years now, people have been po posting and, and sending you information. So if there was ever from a, I don't know, collective consciousness kind of thing aspect, a group to direct this, these types of reports to, it would be you and your team, Lon. Well, I, I guess so, and I appreciate that. But, um, you know, I, I, I don't know, it, it just seems a bit strange to me that we, we were the ones that were kind of the, at the point for this. Uh, I don't know if that was intention. Uh, I mean, I will admit that after the, we started getting the sightings, I was advertising in uh, locally for sighting reports. Uh, but, you know, of course, I was very careful at the reports we were getting. The, um, you know, when somebody would call me, they it was usually because they had Googled Flying man or moth man or wing being, and it, and it would come up on, on Google, but they were unaware of any of the previous sighting. You know, when you know the media itself in, in the Chicago area, it was, it was sparse. I mean, some of the out, some of the smaller outlets uh, were reporting what was going on, but it wasn't to the point where 
it was uh, anything viral or anything to that point. But, um, you know, when people would call me and tell me what they experienced and what they saw, they would be absolutely floored when I would mention to them that there had been other reports. So, uh, you know, you know, I was, uh, you know, we were quite impressed with the witnesses, uh, especially since none of them that I can even think of embellished on what they initially reported to us. And that, that's quite unusual in the cryptid world. Have these flying beings ever been seen in pairs or, or uh, multiples? Because, uh, you know, sometimes Sasquatch, you hear reports of a whole family of them or a pack of dogmen, whatever the case may be. Uh, has there been cases of two or more of these beings either being seen flying together or roosting somewhere? Yeah, one instance uh, out into Lake Michigan, about two miles off of Montrose Beach, uh, there was a uh, report of a group that was in a boat that saw two two of these beings actually flying with each other and doing like figure eights and other types of uh, figures in the in the in the sky. Uh, but as far as other multiple sightings, uh, no, that just wasn't the case. Well, that's interesting, and the fact that. I guess Chicago, I'm trying to refresh my geographic memory. Uh, that's not too far from the Great Lakes. Correct me if I'm wrong. Is that the case? It's right on It's right on Lake Michigan. Yes, right on Lake Michigan. And, of course, mm -hmm. the stories for many generations now about the Great Lakes Triangle, mysterious disappearances there, UFO activity, et cetera. So that area seems to have had Fortean-type phenomena going on for some time. Now, another thing that I'm interested in, in knowing, Lon, is – when you talk to some of these people that have had Sasquatch encounters with certain types of Sasquatch, and even some accounts from uh, the dogman literature, some of these cryptids seem to have this metaphysical capability where they can enter into one's dreams and uh, communicate to them and also do other things along that, uh, along that line. Has any of your team or any of the witnesses talked about having dreams about these uh, flying beings subsequent to having seen them? That hasn't been too prevalent. Um, the only time that that has happened if, is if the, uh, I guess, depending on the degree of shock that they experienced when they saw it, there may be some lingering, uh, you know, dreams or such that will follow it, but not, to a large degree. Yeah, so to some extent, some PTSD lingers in the form of, of right. nightmares. Or, okay, that, that's understandable. Have there any other groups besides your own that have uh, you know, taken up the gauntlet and have really delved into the, uh, uh, the flying beings? Because I, I know sometimes a lot of researchers in certain areas of the country, they kind of focus on what's going on in their neck of the woods, uh, and this seems, yeah. you know, uh, not not entirely uh, specific to Illinois, right. but have you noticed any other people kind of really getting into this now? We had, there was one, at least one group that was kind of piggybacking off of us and trying to ride the coattails, and occasionally they, you know, they still have done it to some degree, but it, it, they have been doing it more on a skeptical level. Mm, yeah. And uh, it has caused a bit of friction. Uh, some of the people involved, um, I don't know what their motives were. I think for the most part, it was trying to be recognized to some degree. Um, so uh, I don't really talk a whole lot about that, but it, it, it I am aware of it. Well, it comes as no surprise to me, Lon, because as you know, uh, throughout the history of cryptozoological research, there's always been this mainstream skeptical effort to, to be dismissive about the subject, to ridicule the subject, to try to find some prosaic explanation, usually, you know, <laughs> hoaxes is, is the knee-jerk kind of 
thing that they come up with. So, mm-hmm. you know, where there's smoke, there's fire. The fact that all these people have contacted you uh, over a protracted period of time, it comes as no surprise to me that this kind of skeptical group pops up. Specifically, it seems to try to debunk these flying being sightings. Uh, well, I see that as almost a backhanded compliment in a way. Well, it, 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 it originally... It originally started because I wouldn't share witness information because it's always confidential. Yes, absolutely. Unless the, unless the witness agrees to uh, allow me to have someone else talk to them. Now, within our group, and in the, these instances, Rosemary on Golly was following up on a lot of sightings that were reported to me. So I was getting some backup there. But this other group, thought it was my duty to supply witness information, which <laughs> is utterly absurd in my mind. I, I would never even do that. And uh, there was some contention about that. Uh, they were trying to say that I didn't give out witness information because nothing had really been reported, you know, that type of thing. So, uh, you know, that's just, you know, I just, I just don't let all that bother me, to be quite honest with you. Yeah, yeah, understandable, because you got bigger fish to fry, Lon. But sure. I, I see a parallel, a direct parallel with some of these UFO debunking groups or these faux UFO researchers who use the excuse of the scientific method to haul off and do nothing. Uh, yep. and, and these types go around, and they, they do the same thing you're talking about. They demand to know who these people are that have had – encounters or have got videotape of ufos and then they go and they harass these people and and imply that they're crazy and have made the whole thing up and well, that's exactly of... what happened in this case yes that's exactly uh, how unfortunately, you know this this seems to be a pattern with one certain group and that's mufon oh yes uh, <laughs> you know that's happened to me here in pennsylvania when we have gotten into investigating certain phenomena where they feel like we're stepping on their toes because, you know, we shouldn't be doing what they're supposed to do. And it happened in Chicago as well. Some of the early reports of the phenomena were reported to MUFON and nothing was done about it. It was never followed up. We actually went out and dug up, you know, through just shoe leather some of these witnesses because we had no access to their information. And when, when that did happen, the, uh, the uh, Illinois state director got a bit upset about it. And then he wanted to get involved in it. Uh, he contacted me directly. He said, you know, we can, we can work together and do this now. And uh, you know, even after they had, refused to do anything about it initially when we started getting results and they became interested. Well, that didn't last long. They, they were only going to share information to a certain point. And, uh, I just totally dismissed MUFON on that. And, uh, you know, it does happen. I mean, you know, I, I used to belong to MUFON. I know a lot of people that have belonged to MUFON. Uh, I have a lot of people that I know that used to be with MUFON and for whatever reason aren't now. And it all kind of tends to follow the same track where, you know, they show little interest in certain types of reports, uh, especially where there's um, entity involvement. So uh, it becomes frustrating. So, be quite honest with him, I, I just stay away from the whole group. It's always important to maintain unit integrity, Lon, and, and I feel the same way. MUFON and other like organizations have been a stumbling block, but especially MUFON, they've just been there to be a hindrance, quite frankly, yeah. to a lot of real research. And you hit the nail on the head when you talked about how they don't want to know anything about the encounter reports because that's where the rubber meets the road is people having face-to-face encounters about with ETs or non-human beings, but they want to keep everything in the statistical lights in the sky kind of thing. And, and I kind of see something like that happening with this whole uh, Navy pilot 
kind of quasi disclosure. It's well, we military, we've got it under control. Yeah, we've known about it all. The Don't time. get me started on that. You know, I uh, that whole situation is strange to me. It, it is the timing of it too, Lon. And while That's we're on true. the subject, and because this is all forty and related anyway, if you wouldn't mind, let, let, let's hear your thoughts on that. Well, I don't know the people involved. I don't know uh, Luis Elizondo. I don't know Tom DeLong. I don't know any of these people. But it just seems awful strange to me personally, uh, and I'm not expressing any thoughts of any of my colleagues, that it just seems very strange that this footage and the fact that Elizondo is a part of it is now being made into a television show to almost the point where the government is spoon feeding us this stuff. Yes. You know, I'm very wary about it. You know, there was a, there was an episode just last night or the night before where they were down in Mexico talking to these fishermen and other people that were in and around the Guadalupe islands. Well, we all know that a lot of these islands on the on the west coast of California, Baja, have had a lot of UFO activity, uh, a lot of USO activity as well. That's something that's well known. The fact that they're now coming out and saying that the Nimitz Group actually had some encounters uh, back in 2004, and that they're showing this to us in the manner they are, just seems highly suspicious to me. Yes, it does. And then they make a big deal about this woo-woo Pentagon uh, Advanced Threat Assessment Group, whatever they're called, with a Mickey yeah. Mouse budget, just a handful of you know, uh, air-to-air missiles. It totally obliterates that budget of theirs. So how could it be taken seriously uh, for a real investigative branch of the Pentagon about UFOs when we know, Lon, they've been doing decades worth of back engineering research on the actual recovered alien hardware. So it, it's, it's a watering down. It's a dilution. It's still keeping it at arm's length because, as you and I know, the encounter reports, which themselves delve into underground bases, under sea bases, deep black military ET uh, interactions, et cetera, et cetera, it's like a milquetoast variety of what's really going yeah. on. And that's what I worry about, Lon, that they're going to p- put this – kind of a watered-down version in front of everyone, get it so they go back to, you know, the people go back to chewing their cud and looking at their cell phones, and then, you know, this priesthood, this made-up priesthood becomes the the go-to guys for all the answers, and they keep it at this watered-down level, and that, that's what I see coming out of this. Yeah, I, I feel the same way. I, um, you know, and even with the TV sh- the series that was presented last year, uh, Project Blue Book, um, that was so distorted as far as the actual events. It, it kind of, uh, even though they tried to make, make it look gruesome at some point, they, they, really, they really distorted the actual events that took place. Uh, they kind of tried to make Heineck look like it was a crazy man. Yeah. yeah. And a few, you know, it, it just, it, it kind of rubbed me the wrong way, the whole thing. Well, what we're seeing now is, on the one hand, you have these people that have been sent out, and I absolutely believe that they're on a leash insofar as they fit a certain psych profile, uh, and they're, telling these stories about being space cowboys and secret space yeah. programs. And what it does, it, it detracts from the real stories of people it, like my colleague, the late Dr. Carla Turner talked about back in the, the eighties and nineties where, right. where you know, people are having real interactions with deep black elements of the military. And the only thing that they have in common is that these people have had ET encounters. So it, it's almost like on the one hand, they set up the circus sideshow act with all these space cowboys on the one hand, and the algorithms on YouTube drive all the viewers to, to their stories. And then the, uh, on the other hand, for people with more of a rational, logical mindset, they set up this kind of faux disclosure group uh, who are, once again, the go-to guys, the new priesthood. Meanwhile, the real encounter stories, the real uh, investigations into the underground bases and, and what have you goes by the wayside. And yeah, I think now is a good segue uh, to talk about a bit about your book. 
Lon, because uh, to me, it, it's a breath of fresh air because I felt for some time that uh, intelligence, counterintelligence, elements thereof played a key role in bringing this new age movement uh, to the forefront. And what the new age has done basically is it's created a lot of pacified, neutralized people, uh, very confused about the whole subject of ETs and ET contact. And th they form their own brand of dismissiveness, of skepticism, of outright debunkery. Whenever anyone comes up and says, well, I've had a negative ET encounter, I've got the marks and the, the traumatic after effects to prove it. What these new agers do is they, they're into the shaming. Oh, you're just unevolved spiritually, et cetera, et cetera. And your book, Lon, I mean, even someone somewhat jaded as myself has been in this field for a while. It made for disturbing reading. Uh, but I, I really applaud you, Lon, for putting those stories out there because it gives the readers a clear picture of the totality of the ET encounter event. It's not all warm and fuzzy ETs. There's some really disturbing things that are going on. Yeah, it really is. I mean, uh, I, I've heard a lot of a lot of reports, a lot of confessions uh, over the years. The, um, in particular, the David Eckhart situation, where he was able to to, and for whatever reason, I still don't think he understands why he was given the opportunity to see a lot of this. Uh, human experimentation, human disposal, humans being used for slaves as well as other other uh, extraterrestrials. It, you know, I've, wor I've been working with David for over 10 years now, and he still has these encounters uh, in his home. Now, he hasn't been abducted for many years, but they, there have been instances of lost time, but it's at the point now where he, he just doesn't remember now. But, the you know, earlier, a lot of this was going on, and uh, it's an intriguing story. It is. And aspects of his story have been reported by others. Uh, you know, the the processing plant, so-called, where, where humans are, are basically being dismembered and processed as, as a food source for the reptilians or somebody mm -hmm. and also accounts of, of humans being utilized as slave labor uh, in these underground tunnel systems and cavern systems and i get the feeling lana this has been going on for a long time and maybe at some level uh, I'm, I'm sure some of the cryptids that we discuss may be responsible for some of the disappearances going on in some of these national parks that, that david politis talks about but I mm -hmm. believe also at some level, especially on, on a larger scale, that you know what David Eckhart talks about has, has a lot to do with the disappearances of people from the surface. Oh, I do too. I, I you know, I, I like I said, I like you said, I think it's on a larger degree as compared to other phenomena. You know, some people may say, well, somebody will walk into a uh, a portal or something by accident, or a Bigfoot or some other creature may take them. Though that's that's harder when if somebody else is with them, that's harder to discern because uh, you know you would think somebody would notice that. But as actual an abduction or lost time, something sudden, without any indication, uh, I, I think that that is a lot of what's going on. And there seem to be a lot of children involved with that as well. Yes, unfortunately. Uh, you know, I was told by David and quite honest with you what I put in the book it is it, just the the mere minimum of what I could have put in there I understand I uh there you know I may go further down the road but honestly I I just didn't want to get it put it in there to where it was just an oversaturation and uh but some of the things that he saw and described to me were just horrific. I mean, un unbelievably horrific. And um, the situation he's been involved with now, which, uh, you know, this is something that has been going on since I wrote the book, that they are showing, these beings are showing up with children that they abducted. Yes. And it's... It's disturbing because I've seen the pictures. 
And uh, these aren't hybrid children. These are young children that have been abducted. And for whatever reason, they are showing him or, or have them tag along with them for wherever they go. It, we have no idea, but it is quite disturbing. It has bothered him. And uh, I haven't released the pictures, but some of my team have seen them. And uh, we have decided that we just don't think it's time to start releasing some of that stuff. And I would agree with that uh, because it's a fine line, Lon, uh, mm -hmm. to, uh, on the one hand, getting meaningful information out, but on the other hand, not putting out certain types of information that will just instill despair and hopelessness in, in a lot of people that know that this is real and take this subject seriously. I mean, most of the surface population, unfortunately, and I hate to sound judgmental, they're still just going to continue to chew their cud and look at their cell phones. Okay, yeah, I'm not yeah. passing judgment on them, but... You know, that's the sugar-coated, candy-coated version of reality. The, what we're talking about is where the rubber meets the road. And for people right. deeply interested in the subject matter, we, we cannot – we would not be true leaders in our field if we instilled a sense of hopelessness and despair and fear in people. Uh, it's, it's important to be aware that, hey, this is going on. At some point, we have to do something about it. But at the same time, we cannot instill fear and hopelessness in people. Well, I tried to cover both ends of the spectrum on this. Um, you know, I have examples where people were actually healed. David was one of those. He was healed from a very severe arthritic, uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, I have another instance of a woman by the name of Maria who lived in Puerto Rico who was cured of cancer. Um, they do tend to offer their services in a, in a benevolent way in some, you know, it's at some levels, but you know, of course there are these reports where there have been, you know, more gruesome, more horrific types of encounters that, uh, you know, it, it's good to report those things. Uh, I have one story in there from a, a lady who was, um, who was having, uh, her and her mother were experiencing light phenomena and noise and stuff at home. And after I talked to her the next day, that same evening, she disappeared. And she's yes. never been heard of yes. since. It was the Mandy story. That was, Mandy, that was troubling. Right? Yeah. <clears throat> uh, and I've always felt kind of guilty about that because, you know, I, I, I had a feeling when I was talking to her that the minute – the phenomena that was occurring in and around her property was going to get worse. I just had that feeling. And uh, I was hoping it wasn't going to lead to anything more serious. But unfortunately, I didn't get much opportunity to kind of work with her and tell her to be care careful at some point. Now, what exactly happened to her, I don't know. I, I believe that she was taken for a specific reason and just never returned Yes, and in the literature, when people really delve into it, these disappearances and, you know, delving into the human mutilation cases, they're not unheard of. They do happen, mm -hmm. and there have been uh, cases if some of – and I, I do believe that some of the leaked documentation uh, that's wound up in, in the so-called Majestic Papers by uh, the father and son uh, Wood, Wood family, I think they're called uh, – they talk about in some of those documents about how uh, like a community in, in Canada, deep in the woods, just up and disappeared uh, like in the 19th century. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and there have been other similar cases. We know that the, the intercepts of uh, fighter planes, of UFOs, over time, things turned out quite tragically for, for the humans piloting those craft. We've known of disappearances, we've known of crashes, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, it, it's not all new age. It's not all love and light. It, it, it gets, you know, pretty dark. But, you know, if we're true to ourselves, we have to look into these, the, these subjects. Well, I, you know, I, I guess the ufology genre is something that's kind of taken off since 1947, since the Roswell incident and you know but we like, a lot of times we don't look 
what what happened before that. Yes. And this phenomenon has been going on for a long, long time. I mean, uh, encounters with these, and I personally believe, and you, you read the book, I personally believe that our whole civilization or all of humanity was affected by these uh, these gods, these beings from other from the cosmos, basically. I, yeah, I think there definitely. I think there are some examples where this very well could have happened, uh, especially in the Egyptian civilization. Uh, I have been shown some things over time uh, that really stuck with me. And, you know, I have my own theories on a lot of that as well. Well, you touched on some of that in your book, uh, and I can't recall exactly whether it came to you in, in a mystical vision or as a remote, or result of remote viewing, but it had to, deal, to do with these advanced civilizations uh, of yore that we hear about, Lemuria, Atlantis, and, and, and ancient Egypt and whatnot. Would you like to comment on that? Well, you know, I've always wondered why – you know, these alien beings are extraterrestrial, so concerned with Earth and uh, our, you know, our species. And, um, you know, after a long time of research, investigation, even personal experience, uh, I, I believe that there was an earlier intervention between the Earth inhabitants and otherworldly beings. And I, I believe the time period was somewhere in the 13th and 12th millennia BC. Now, I don't believe this was the only interchange. I'm, th- I'm quite sure there were many more. But I think at that period of time that the interchange was probably the most important. Now, I, I've done a lot of remote viewing sessions on this. I've had three personal non-terrestrial encounters and one in which I had lost time. Uh, but... During that one period, I, I was shown a historical scenario in the presence of these beings. Uh, I did witness a colossal, disc-shaped craft dis, uh, descend and land in the area of the present-day Nile River Delta. Now, at that time, uh, this location was completely encircled by the Mediterranean Sea, and this craft was uh, later transformed into a, a massive island. Uh, I believe this was the genesis of a great empire that encompassed the surrounding indigenous people in the land. Um, the rulers of this empire were the occupants of the craft that landed there. Now, their knowledge was uh, disseminated throughout the region and their bloodline was merged into the indigenous people. The, um, the communication that I received from these beings when I was in their presence was that this empire was the nexus of a lot of the dominant and even a few of the lesser civilizations around the Mediterranean. You know, it's interesting, I, when I, and I did ask them, was this Atlantis? But I never got a response to that question. Um, I, I I did witness representations of various cultures that developed over millennia. Um, there were some glimpses of time, while others were you know just mighty empires. But all the direct communication they all had direct communication with the occupants of this craft. Now, there was real emphasis made to the development of the ancient Egyptians. Now, I observed what I call order created out of chaos, basically a civilization that was deeply influenced by the beliefs of this extraterrestrial and for thousands of years, they were, they were continued intervention of the alien gods. You know, when you look at the, um, when you look at the Egyptian religion and culture, 
these gods were all represented as uh, a humanoid type being with the head of a, of a native creature. I, I think that was, a, that was something that was done purposely to, um, you know, to, to try to influence the people to see them as deities, as gods, and that to make these people feel more comfortable with them. You know, I was presented with uh, a particular series of events that occurred during Egypt's 18th dynasty. Uh, this says that dynasty was actually classified as the uh, new kingdom of Egypt, an era where uh, Egypt achieved a lot of its power. A profound encounter occurred during the reign of Ahemhotep III, which greatly affected the royal family and the priesthood. Now, the, the encounter was interpreted by Amenhotep III as a divine message that the pharaoh was a god that rivaled Amun-Ra in the priesthood. Now, Amenhotep III's display of power and disdain for the priesthood was watched closely by his son, Amenhotep IV, who later changed his name to Akhenaten. When Akhenaten became pharaoh, he established a quasi-monotheistic belief in the solar deity Aten, which I believe was the representation of an alien being or craft. You know, and you know, as as this goes on, and after the family and the priesthood had this inter, this uh, intervention. I also believe that the brother of Ahnotep IV, who was Prince Tutmos, who was earlier banished into the eastern desert for unknown reasons, later returned to Egypt during the early 19th dynasty as the Hebrew prophet Moses. Now, there, there's, a, there's been a lot of research into that over the years, uh, Freud even believed that this may have been the case himself. Uh, Edgar Casey basically prophesied something very similar to this. But my perception of what had happened is not based on any of their conclusions. This is something that I did see. I was given the opportunity to see. And uh, I felt it was important to put it in the beginning of my book to kind of get people to uh, have an idea of what I thought, my premise of what may have been going on and what we may expect and the reason why things are going on as they are now. And I'm glad you put it in there, uh, Lon. It was interesting because it was an eye-opener for me when I read that because from more than one source, and one of these instances was – basically a remote viewing effort as well, where we had pinpointed that exact moment in history, that particular dynasty, uh, Akhenaten and his father, as being a key nodal point uh, mm -hmm. in, in this timeline, in this, this part of history. And also, you know, the when you extrapolate on what came out of that, uh, monotheism came out of that. And, of course, you know, there's... It's a whole other subject entirely, but it's in, intimately related to what we're talking about and how the whole concept of monotheism led to all these endless wars of religion, et cetera, et cetera. But anyhow, we, we've reached the end of a fascinating first segment. Uh, Lon, would you like to give our listeners uh, your website again? Yeah, the website is fansandmonsters.com. Fansandmonsters.com, and the book is called Alien Disclosure, and I really recommend it. Okay, we've reached the end of the first segment with our guest, Lon Strickler. If you like what we do, if you believe in what we do, please go to thecosmicswitchboard.com, sign up and become a member, and we'll see you at the top of the next segment.